today on Call Out. Nilsson Search and Rescue rings in the new year with three back-to-back -back missions. Very often we get called out on New Year's Eve and again, voila, 10, 20 on a New Year's Eve, we're going out. And later, Canadian Sartex students on a training exercise in the Arctic have fun breaking up their igloos, but regret it later. Any small mistake, we keep telling them it could cost them their lives. Tuesday, 9 p.m. Nelson Search and Rescue receives a call out for an overdue snowboarder. Eli Bergevin, a local electrician and young father of two, was last seen riding on his own at noon at the Whitewater Winter Resort. Expected home at 4.30, he was reported overdue by his family. It really was not a good picture. It had snowed a lot. It was continuing to snow very heavily. It was very cold out. Uh, it was very socked in, so the visibility was not good at all. The subject is not prepared to be out overnight and does not have an avalanche beacon. One of our biggest concerns is the avalanche danger. Because of safety factors, we couldn't send the teams out into the field. There was too many hazards and risks that could not be properly assessed until daylight. So we did what we call an attract it. They opt for a sound sweep, a SAR vehicle will drive the road leading to Whitewater Winter Resort, periodically stopping to blare their sirens and call out. Eli, Eli, search and rescue. Yellow, if you can hear us. The team hears a sound. Yeah, I heard something. They get out for a listen. I thought I heard something. Yeah. Avalanche danger might await in the woods, but if the lost snowboarder is nearby, it's time to change the plan. Yellow, if you can hear us. Nope. Whatever sound they heard before has stopped. I thought we heard something there. It's getting late, and there's not much more they can do tonight. Yeah, I'm wondering if the SAR vehicle with the lights and that should carry on down and you guys come up top. Search manager Cindy Jones sends most of the team home. Insert you out. A two-person crew continues to travel back and forth along the road, a moving beacon of hope for the lost snowboarder. Cindy Jones goes home too, but she's got work ahead of her yet. Setting up our team members that are going to respond, finding a helicopter and an avalanche professional to go up in that helicopter and organizing all the other resources that are going to be required for the day. It's a long time before I get to go to sleep if I really get to rest at all. This is Nelson Search and Rescue. Can you hear us? Back on the mountain, the night crew continues their sound sweep. Sam, we got him. There he is. Hey. At 2 a.m., Eli is spotted on the road walking towards them. Eli? It's a happy outcome and a familiar story. He'd started his last run of the day as the sun was setting. The fog came in on me and uh, I lost my bearings. I lost my reference points. It, it got dark and I just holed up. I made a snow cave. The clouds lifted and Eli spotted the flashing lights of the SAR vehicle. I just started hiking through the flats until I got to the road here and I could see light from the search and rescue vehicle and so I'm super thankful. The morning search won't be necessary, but less than 24 hours later, the team is called out again. The other people that are going to be doing the checkpoint are not on Wednesday, 10 p.m. Two backcountry skiers from Alberta, Don Atto and Cindy Lawrence, are reported overdue by family. This is their vehicle right here. Luckily, it's the pair had signed in at the Whitewater Winter Resort before embarking on their backcountry adventure. They had filled out their registry, uh, letting us know where their destination was, their trip destination, as well as the estimated time of return. So Nelson Search and Rescue could have a starting point as to where to go search. The skier's route was through the Hummingbird Pass near the Whitewater Winter Resort. By now, they could be going in any direction, hopefully towards the road below. There's quite a lot of avalanche danger. We've got 10 seas that have fallen today. Um, we're not going to send crews into that area until morning, so we've uh, brought our SAR truck up here. We've had two members who are going to stay here for the entire night with the lights going, making lots of noise with a siren. Even with this weather, if they can uh, see the lights or hear the sound, they have something to come to. At this point, we're leaving from 
It's 10 a.m. New Year's Eve, day two of the search, white water. Still two missing skiers in the backcountry, an area known as Wales Back, Hummingbird Pass. Ten centimeters of snow has fallen. It's time to ramp up the search. Ground crews get geared up. We've got a low cloud cover. Uh, it's kind of a skiering the peaks and the ridge lines, so a bit of issue there getting a helicopter to pause the teams. Looks like it'll be ground pounding all day long and uh, get people out there, saturate the area, see if we can uh, pick up a trail or find them. A search helicopter with Avtex is already combing the backcountry and assessing avalanche conditions. Now, yes, have them move to uh, East Peak for better comms. Team Bravo, Star Base. Go ahead for Bravo. The recent yeah, snowfall move. should make it easy to spot fresh tracks. And indeed, they do. Stand by, you're quite close to the track that the helicopter spotted. And, uh, Ground crews are directed to the area to meet up with the subjects. The helicopter crew spots the rescue team and subjects walking out through the trees but has no place to land. Luckily, the subjects are in good health and able to walk out under the guidance of the ground crew. So it's about one o'clock. The team has brought them back up to the pass. We had a snowcat go up and pick them up and they've just arrived here at base. Hugs are shared, introductions made, and thanks given. The rescued skiers are checked out by BC Ambulance, then debriefed. Don and Cindy were fairly well equipped, but new at backcountry trekking. They simply took a wrong turn, lost their bearings, and couldn't find their way out. The team goes home, but not for long. 10.20 p.m. A skier is reported overdue, yet again at the Whitewater Winter Resort. Identified only as Alex, he was reported missing by a casual acquaintance and last seen on a black diamond run. A lone vehicle with U.S. license plates has been left in the ski parking lot. The out-of-country plates could not be run until morning. Very often we get called out on New Year's Eve, and again, voila, 10.20 on New Year's Eve, we're going out. A good-sized crew musters and gears up. Let's get it done. The plan is to catch a lift up the mountain with the groomer cats. So we're loading up here in the cats to take us up to the top of Whitewater. It's a full moon tonight, snowing quite a bit here, but it's actually really quite bright, so our visibility is going to be pretty good. It's exactly 2010. Oh, happy New Year. You too, man. Well, that's pretty fast response. I think the RCMP were only up here about an hour before you guys showed up. We knew we'd be going out again tonight. It's just, it always happens. Thanks a lot, dude. Yeah, no worries. Just poke into the trees a little bit, stop, talk, listen, and jump out. The team goes over the search plan. Call Alex on the count of three. One, two, three. We're in a very safe zone for avalanches or anything like that, so we've got our, uh, our beacons actually on receive, so if he's in a tree well or somewhere off the side, we can uh, pick up his tone as we're going through. The crew does two passes down the mountain with no results, then call it a night. It's uh, one o'clock in the morning, January 2010. We've completed our sound search, uh, had no luck locating the subject. Due diligence has been served. We've done the best we can in the conditions we had, so uh, pack it up, go home, get some sleep. It's been a long couple days. It turns out the lost skier had simply left his car overnight in the ski parking lot without informing anyone. Unfortunately, this happens, but the team still goes out. Why? This time, it was just a car in the parking lot, but in the past, it's turned out to be something much more serious. 
We'd rather just go have a look, because if we don't, we'll probably spend the whole night worrying about it anyway. Now, Canadian StarTech trainees go on their first rescue mission in the high Arctic. There's been an Inuit seal hunter that's been missing for a day and a half. If someone needs rescue in Canada's vast wilderness, Canadian Forces Search and Rescue Technicians, SARTEX, go in when no one else will. These 13 SARTEX trainees from CFB Comox, British Columbia, are doing an eight-day on-the-ground Arctic training phase near Resolute Bay, Nunavut, one of the coldest places on Earth. They're here to learn how to survive and save lives in the Arctic. The students spent the first two days building fighter trenches and single-person snow caves, staying at the Narwhal Hotel while getting acclimatized to the severe Arctic cold. Then, they trekked seven kilometers to Crystal City, a Sartek training camp where they've stayed outside 24 hours a day for the past four days. They're now living in igloos, constructed under the guidance of Inuit subject matter experts Simon Idlaut and his son, Absalom. Day seven, one student is now in the hospital with frostbite. The rest of the trainees are on a short trek from their igloo camp, tasked with building multi-person snow caves. A multi-person snow cave is essentially a larger version of the single-person model. It has three levels to help trap the heat. The third level, is simply made larger to accommodate more than one person for sitting or sleeping. I start digging. Very, very important today, guys, about your layering system. You're gonna get very warm, very quick, okay? So be wary about that. They try not to work up a sweat, as it will freeze and increase the risk of hypothermia. When I was a kid, I would say this would be fun. It's hard work. You can clearly see there's tons of room. Yeah, definitely. Two, two guys in that one. Yeah, man. And then, you know, be uh, pretty warm for the night. I mean, that's uh, really decent. The team puts in a full day building the shelters, then return to Crystal City to spend another cold night in their igloos. Once the door is all chinked up and stuff, it uh, gets pretty warm in there. But once all the uh, heating sources are turned off, it uh, cools off pretty quick. So. Oddly enough, yeah, I am loving it. The, the other students think I'm a little messed up, but I, uh, I was looking forward to this video. It's morning, day eight. Believing they'll spend tonight, their last night, in the comfort of the Narwhal Hotel in Resolute Bay, they stop thinking about survival and blow off some steam by destroying their igloos. It's a move they'll regret later. However, the fun and games stop immediately when a rescue mission comes up. There's been an Inuit seal hunter that's been missing for a day and a half. So the RCMP contacted his wife, and she's given him two known locations where he may be at. You guys are tasked to go check out these two locations. They ask the questions that will help them devise the best plan to find the missing hunter. Yes, he does. He's got a history of high blood pressure. And since when? So you've been uh, there now. They're divided into two teams, Alpha and Bravo, and tasked to go to separate locations. Pick up your packs, move over there. Go. It's a simulated exercise, but the instructors keep them under the gun. They sort out the necessary resources to take with them. Yes, yes. Lantern, the kit yes. request is checked over. Med kit, yes. APJ night, negative. Star tent, no. You guys will have exactly five minutes to get that kit together right here. Are there any questions? Just two pots, two pans. The teams plot their direction based on the location coordinates where the hunter was last seen. Then, trek through the Arctic snow in search of the missing subject. Weather has come in, damn near zero visibility. In this scenario, it's supposed to be zero visibility. The priority is to stabilize the patient and shelter him from the elements. Alpha team looks after the casualty. Bravo team digs snow caves for the needed shelter. 
All their Arctic training is coming into play now. We have everything. It may be a simulation, but the students take their tasks seriously. The shelter is almost ready. Time to move the patient. Corporal Rasmussen, a medical technician before remastering as a Sartek, is assigned to stay watch on the casualty while the rest dig in to complete the shelters. They now have a spot to keep the patient out of the wind. The instructors inform the rescue team that the weather has cleared enough for them to leave the shelters and get the patient back to the igloo camp at Crystal City. On returning to camp, the news is delivered. One, uh, one person gets they must spend another 18 hours with no extra supplies in the igloos they destroyed. A shelter here is your lifeline. And to make assumptions, especially in the Arctic, any small t uh, mistake, we keep telling them, could cost them their lives. We anticipated uh, our departure from Crystal City and we wanted to get some pictures on top of the igloos. And uh, we fell through the tops of the igloos and we kind of carried on with the melee. We got into a little bit of heat for that. So we, uh, we get what we deserve. It's go time again, and they're going to have a life lesson from this. The students look after each other, share their food, and work out a plan for spending the night. You fit four guys in there, four guys in here, four guys in there. You sort of learn just from mistakes while you're here, and what you do at night, where you put your gloves in, in what layer of your sleeping bag, and whatever. So the first night I didn't put it, anything away to keep it nice and dry, but you ended up getting full of condensation. So but little things like that you pick up on. Definitely more prepared than when I got here. And tonight will be the best night of them all. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the rescue. Rescue for the Sartek students means being allowed to trek back to Resolute for a warm night at the Narwhal Hotel. But that's up to the instructors. There's four. Yeah, there's, four. there's four in there. There's four. Sergeant McGrath comes around to see how the trainees have handled the latest curve thrown their way. The students' organization pays off. In 15 minutes, I want everyone to sit in the toboggan, every one of you behind that garage. And if you're not there in 15, we're going to change the complexion again. This is your chance. 15 minutes. Right, right, 15 minutes. Everything up. A bit of hustle now to pack up their gear on time, and they won't have to spend another night in their igloos. They'll go back to the Narwhal Hotel after six days of living and working outside in severe Arctic conditions. OK, listen up. Right now, what I want to do is I want to debrief the exercise that we did this morning. That's where we're going to start. Saw some good things happen in that exercise. A couple things we're going to touch on, though. Never assume anything. They're chewed out for breaking up their igloos. There's a valuable lesson to be learned about focusing on survival at all times. If you factor in the worst, absolute worst situation that could ever happen to you, like a whiteout came when we were walking down that creek bed or that river bed, and that's all the shelter you had, if you factor that in, you wouldn't have been tap dancing on your igloos. Factor in the worst case scenario. That's what we do in our job all the time. And then we switch on the fly. That is what we do. We go in because nobody else goes. OK? We are the last resource. So stick that in your cabbages for the rest of your training. Dig deep. Back to the exercise. The students begin their final trek, this time back to Resolute in preparation for the trip home. Um, we're going to stop at the communications tower, that's their checkpoint. We're going to do a five minute uh, halt there. Post 43! Rescue! It, the Arctic is exactly what I thought it would be. It's a beautiful spot, it's a, uh, it's a relentless and ruthless spot, it can be. Um, if you're cold, there's no way to get warm unless you have the training to do it. And that is what we came here to get, is to figure out how to survive in this environment. And uh, I got a lot of experience from it. The Arctic training phase is complete. These students are now one step closer to becoming fully certified Canadian Forces search and rescue technicians. The next time they see the Arctic, 
It could very well be to parachute out of a Hercules and onto the ice, in the dark, to save lives. Call out search and rescue features, real stories, filmed live by search and rescue teams during actual missions. Find out more at calloutsar.tv.